The title of the panel you have it there, which is Computational Engineering and Science Next, right? And first, I'm going to introduce uh, the panelists. So you know Karen Wilcox, she already talked, so I'm going to do like a short introduction in case you, are, you just got here. Uh, so she's a professor in uh, University of uh, Texas, uh, Austin, and uh, she's the vice president for research also there. She spent some time at MIT before joining uh, UT Austin, and she's also a professor in the Santa Fe Institute. Um, so uh, she worked before joining MIT, she worked in Phantom Works for Boeing, and she's a fellow of the uh, Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics, and American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and recently a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Um, so then I'm going to introduce uh, Brett Savoy. Uh, he's uh, the Charles and Nancy Davidson Associate Professor in Chemical Engineering at Purdue. And he graduated from Texas A&M, no Austin, sorry. <laughs> and he obtained, and he obtained uh, his uh, PhD and master's there. No, his PhD in Northwestern University. Uh, he works on developing uh, physics-based models and machine learning methods to characterize and discover organic materials. Uh, he's the recipient of the ACS, PRF, and NSF Career Awards and also the ONR Young Investigator Award. Uh, then we have Eugenio Colorcielo. Okay, so he received his uh, PhD degrees in Hopkins University. He's a professor in the School of Biomedical Engineering here at Purdue. Uh, he directs the eLab Laboratory. Uh, his research focuses on uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning, robotics, uh, and 3D understanding healthcare and science applications. Uh, so he also received the Presidential Early Career. Uh, he also he received the Presidential Early Career Award, uh, um, and uh, his. Um, the thing I found really interesting and I want to mention is that uh, he founded this uh, FWDNXT, right? to deliver next generation synthetic brains for artificial intelligence. Um, and last, uh, Ale Strachan, uh, he's the Railo Professor of Materials Engineering at Purdue University, and he's also the co-director of the NanoHub, NSF-funded NanoHub. Uh, before joining Purdue, he was at uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, his area of expertise is uh, developing predictive models uh, for atomistic multiscale models using also artificial intelligence. Um, so he has been recognized by several awards. Uh, for example, they, uh, he received the R&D 100 award for uh, software and services for NanoHub. Um, before we talk about... Uh, I start asking questions to all of you. So, uh, so you talk about digital twins uh, at the beginning, right? And I think the title of our panel is What's Next, right? And I was wondering how you think we can train, right? And how students need to be trained to be, for example, working in the area of digital twins. What, what things are needed? If you want to elaborate on that. Yeah. Um. So first I'll say I think it's a very exciting but also challenging time to be a student because the reality is that the things you need to train for the world that's coming are so much more than you can possibly hope to pack into certainly four years of undergrad, which is why then you've got to keep packing, packing it in, uh, in, in graduate school. But, you know, for sure, and you already heard some of my biases during the talk, linear algebra is so foundational to so many things. Uh, and I think really having a very strong foundation in linear algebra helps you in so many directions of things that are relevant to digital twins, whether it's optimization, machine learning, or the solvers that go into physics-based models. This linear algebra is absolutely foundational. So I think that that's a, a really big one. Um, you know, computing skills, uh, one of the big changes for me in moving from MIT to UT Austin 
is the ecosystem and the classes and just the culture around computing. My graduate students at MIT really struggled to get enough exposure to high performance computing and scalable algorithms in their coursework. At UT Austin, we have absolutely fantastic classes. We have the supercomputer center that I mentioned, tech. And uh, I think that kind of exposure to computing at scale, no matter sort of what your field is, is also something that's just incredibly important. And then of course, there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of, of other topics. There's a, there's a lot, but those are, I mean, if I had to pick two, just to make sure you don't neglect, it would, well, would probably be clean linear algebra and high performance computing, but that's, a, that's, a that's an unfair question, Marisol. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I think I can ask the same question to all of you, but maybe we don't focus on digital twins and you want to focus on your area, right? On, uh, for example, what gaps are in your area? And I'm going to ask this question to the other three, right? Uh, in applying machine learning or, or AI, right, to your area of research and how do you think you need to be trained to train the students and what they need? Yeah, so it's... Uh... Definitely not a fair, not a fair question, but uh, to piggyback a little bit on what we heard, I think um, I'm really a big booster for AI by and for engineers. So I don't think anything that we saw today would have been possible with someone with a purely CS background. So the integration of the domain expertise into the development of these systems is, I think, so central. So how do you, how do you train up on all of this stuff without neglecting the, the domain expertise that actually makes these breakthroughs possible? So at the one, on the one hand, I would just caution against you know, dispensing with too much of the domain, what we would traditionally call domain expertise. We still have to really cherish that. But um, I think that we can accelerate the mode of doing engineering and science. So I mean, I think a lot of us here probably use large language models as part of their daily activities now, right? So it's accelerating a lot of the things that I used to have uh, manual processes for. Um, I'm probably using them in unorthodox ways compared to the ways that people trained them. But just like we used to push down programming to lower and lower levels, I think we are going to be pushing down artificial intelligence training to lower and lower levels in our curriculum. I think being able to use these tools effectively is going to be um, just as important as traditional programming. Somebody said, don't think about technology. Well, Eugenio, do you want to yes. give your take on this? Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, first, of, first, I wanted to thank you for the very interesting talk and, and tell you that I actually agree with you, even though I'm a machine learning well. person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well. I agree with you. Uh, and I think it's, um, um, if you have a question, I think it's, uh, it's really the way to go, yeah. <laughs> That's right. If you have equations. If you have equations, yes. And um, um, I also a second um, that linear algebra and computers are very important because even in machine learning, <laughs> those are the, the main ingredients, yes. And um, um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yes. So I, I can chime in a little bit. And I, I think this is going to be a very boring panel because we all agree. And, <laughs> So that's the worst possible panel you can have. Uh, so I'll, I'll be a little provocative. And so if we think about it, uh, teaching, okay, so first of all, fundamentals, whether it's linear algebra, domain expertise, the fundamentals need to be there. We're engineers, scientists. Uh, that's that's the, the first thing. The other thing is, uh, and, and I think digital twins bring it to the forefront, you really need uh, experimental data and data science and models all together. And I think often in education, we're very compartmentalized. You go, you have a lab course and then you do lab and you treat data, just put it on a, a spreadsheet. And then you, you, maybe you do a Python course and you don't think about the lab. And it's really one thing. And the last thing I would say, maybe controversial is, I, for education, this, this is challenging. You know, these, these models are complicated. You need infrastructure. I would encourage us to think about digital cousins. They don't have to be twins. If you're being educated, maybe a, an okay model is okay uh, to train students in the idea that data and models and predictive models can be brought together, okay? And uh, the models might not be the models that you need a supercomputer to run because you just can't afford it. Uh, maybe a surrogate model would be a reduced order model uh, would be a good example. 
uh, but even if the model, no model is perfect. And so just don't let the excellent be the enemy of the good. And the digital cousins uh, might be the way to go for education, uh, certainly at the undergraduate level. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, right? So um, I have uh, some thoughts about uh, how to, uh, so AI research assistance, right? So you can use uh, high throughput experiments and uh, use robots, right, to synthesize materials and see how these materials respond to different uh, environments. Uh, you can use uh, simulations, right? Uh, and you can come up with high throughput simulations and then uh, use that to infer a reduced order model. Um, so what are your thoughts and your experience on uh, AI research assistance to do all that, right? And I think I'm going to start with you because we discussed this uh, no. yes. before. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Um, I mean, I think it's, a, it's an interesting area that is, has been developing uh, more recently, uh, maybe, you know, because um, we're living on the success of this uh, generative model, a large language model, and, and the capability, and maybe we feel a little bit cocky <laughs> now, and we think, okay, maybe if we can scale this to understand the more of our data, uh, they could uh, become some kind of a science assistant. Um, and the truth um, is that um, um, I, th I think it is going to ha happen. I think it's, it's the future, but there's still like a lot of uh, um, different hurdles that we have to overcome. Um, and I think probably the, the first one is that um, we still don't have a model that can, can understand, uh, um, you know, the textbooks or diagrams, equations or plots. Uh, uh, even the, the things that you, that you showed in your talk, uh, the level we, we understand them yet, uh, maybe because um, li large language models, for example, at, at the moment, they just rely on text, right? And uh, a lot of the, this research could be visual or, um, and even understanding uh, data, um, of course you can say, yeah, I trained a neural network model, but uh, um, there's always a goal in the training, and it's never general, so we, we don't expect something new. Um, but in uh, AI um, a science assistant, for example, uh, it would have to create something more that we haven't thought about, right? And so I think that's, uh, that's really a challenge. Um, and uh, um, since I'm personally bad with equations, so maybe that's why <laughs> I'm in machine learning, I also hope that uh, they'll be able to write them for me. <laughs> So any other one who had experience uh, using AI research assistance uh, uh, and your thoughts on that? I, I can chime in quickly. I, I think they will accelerate our research. And again, you need the fundamentals, you need the expertise. But in my group, we run molecular dynamics. And this is an interesting story. Um, it's a code called LAMS from Sandia National Lab that a lot of people use, but it's molecular dynamics. It's not Python. And uh, about a year back, uh, a few of my students decided to ask GPT to write inputs uh, to run the MD simulations, basically writing what you write in your paper in the method section and ask GPT to write the input scripts to run the simulations. And uh, we ended up writing a paper documenting how well it does. And for simple tasks, it gets it, per, you know, right 100% of the time. And as you get more and more complicated, it gets you 90% there. So you still need the expertise, uh, but we spend months training our students on this completely arbitrary input language that the creator of, creators of LAMPS generated. You need to know the commands, the order in which the commands need to be input, inputted, and that doesn't mean that you know molecular dynamics, right, or the physics. It just knows how, you, you just need to know how to set up the simulation. So I think in that sense, that's, that's super, uh, it, it is very productive. It can save us a lot of time. We even went back to my, a paper that I wrote as a grad student, and I'm old enough that LAMPS didn't exist back then, and we wrote our own codes, and cut and paste from my paper, and LAMPS could actually 
uh, do the simulation in one of my papers as a, a PhD student. And I'm telling you it's easy because I did it. I actually asked LAM, uh, GPT, I cut and paste it and run it. So I, th I think there's a lot of potential for it. So I guess we switch from, uh, the, the, uh, do you want to say something? Sorry. Well, I was just going to give just a slightly different viewpoint, which I think in, in answering your question, it's important to ask, are these menial research tasks that just have to be done and there's something to be said for some kind of automation that accelerates them, or are these research tasks that are actually, yes, they're tasks in the path to achieving research, but it's the, it's the experience that of doing them that is the educational value. And, you know, I often remark, yes, we, we go around the world, we talk about our research, you know, we get awards for our research. My output is not research. My output is people. You know, you ask me as an academic, what is my product? My product is people. They're the students I educate. And, you know, I think back and I realize I'm probably quite old fashioned, but uh, teaching the controls class at MIT, no calculators and exams, and I made the students do things by hand that even then could very easily be done by computers. Why? Because I wanted them to deeply understand what a pole zero plot means and how to manipulate it, not because they were going to need to be able to do that in their, in their real life. And so I just, I am a little fearful, and I think it's probably just important to separate out the menial and low value where automation will accelerate research and improve the experience in the lab from the perhaps menial but really essential to getting that intuition and being a part of the educational experience. And if AI starts to replace research assistants in the latter, I really start to get worried. Yeah. So you guys are, are safe for now. <laughs> you get to keep your menial task. <laughs> you get to keep your menial task. Yeah. So I think somehow, uh, do you want to add sure. something? Sure, I, I couldn't agree more. So um, also when it comes to democratizing the research experience as well. So uh, the things that cause the most friction are oftentimes the ones that are foremost in our mind, but those aren't actually the, the what we consider research. The core, what is the human adding to this process? Oftentimes it isn't those laborious things. And so this can actually really clarify the role of the scientist and engineer in tasks. Um, and then when it comes to democratizing, you can see that in involving undergraduates. So, you know, the training of, of, of an initial researcher, there's often a ton of friction before they can ever even do a single meaningful thing. And um, I think you can get, you can shorten that time dramatically with some of these tools. Um, so that's just another example of getting them closer to research faster. But it's not that you, it's not that you've gotten rid of the human being, but it's that you've compressed a lot of the friction out of the process yeah. using these tools. And that's the challenge in education. What, what, what are the skills that our students need to focus on which are uniquely human or we think are uniquely human versus the more uh, mundane tasks that might not be as needed when we have better automation? I, I learned how to take square roots uh, uh, by hand. I, I don't use it. Uh, it's, it's not a useful skill uh, it currently. I'm sure they don't even know what you're talking about. Well, yeah, some of the young ones. No. By hand, the calculator is square root, not of nine. You mean with a pencil? <laughs> with a pencil. <laughs> so I think we, if somehow uh, from uh, AI research assistants, we talk also about uh, large language models, right, that are using uh, speech recognition, image recognition, right? Um, so how do you think this techniques can also be used in engineering and in science and how they can be exploded. And I'm going to start with you. Um, something that's very interesting about what has happened in the past year is that we've developed these tools that we still are not sure what they're capable of. So that's a really fascinating, I, I don't know of any analogy here, actually. We've created this object that we are still prod, the only way to figure out what it can do is by prodding it and experimenting with it. And so um, I, I don't actually know the answer to that question because we don't know what the models we already have today are capable of. And then as, uh, as we were talking about earlier, as we start to get more information sources into these things, like actual images, not just sort of compressed uh, 
image to text translations of them or actual tabular engineering data, I don't think we really know what they're going to be capable of. So an example that we're working on in my group is, uh, uh, we, we've actually been experimenting with whether or not these things can generate good hypotheses. And uh, you know, when it comes down to coaching it, so you try to coach it and give it a description of this is an example of a good hypothesis. You have to come up with a pretty, pretty formulaic definition of what is a hypothesis in its relationship to a data set. And I've been actually quite shocked by how good it is at, at suggesting hypotheses. Um, when I coach it and I say this hypothesis has to be testable, and you give it instructions like it has to be testable in a relatively small research laboratory. So what's an additional data set that could be generated to test this? Um, I've been really surprised at its ability to suggest quite practical things that I would expect out of a colleague, for instance. So that's one example that I think just hints at what might be possible some of these in the, in the context of research. Virginia, do you want to add in? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a... Uh, um, yeah, it's a very fascinating field, I think, and yeah, you're right, right, that we still don't know what all these things can do, and uh, we're still trying to identify um, all the capabilities, um, and it'll probably take a while. I, I, to me, it, it, it seems like um, it, it turns out to be a very good model of, uh, of a human brain, uh, in a way, even though it's just trained on text. Um, and, uh, and sometimes, you know, when we interact with another person, we also have to find out what do they know, what can they do, and, um, uh, and, and so we have to somehow use the same kind of test, I think, but um, the real question is, to me, is, you know, how do we go uh, from, from this system to having something that uh, we can uh, really generate uh, conceptualized um, the, the essence of a problem, you know, the way that, um, that we do it or engineering students do it. Um, I've seen, recently I've seen video of, uh, of Sora, this, this new generative AI that generates video. And I've seen, for example, it was like simulating water <laughs> uh, in the video and it looks really realistic. And, uh, uh, and, and the question is, uh, okay, what, what does he know actually about, uh, you know, the physics of, of water? And, uh, in theory, is is only seen a video as example of this, right? Um, but can you? Uh, but in a way, uh, that's uh, that's similar to maybe our brain works. If you if you take a maybe not non-engineering person, <laughs> uh, when we see, we can think or we can visualize water in our mind, but uh, and and how it moves. Uh, although we cannot maybe replicate where every single particle is, but at least we have a perception of physical perception of it I think it's it's just interesting to to find out uh, how much do they really know these models right about physics I, I really haven't no the just quickly to the students you know uh, alpha zero these type of programs can it be be the grandmasters at chess um, but a combination of a computer program and a human can be the best computer programs. And so that to me is what's exciting about our area. So what type of combination of human intelligence and these tools, which are tools, um, uh, would, would lead us to push our fields forward fast. Okay, so um, in Every single of your areas, right? So I think my question is going to be now, um, what is the most exciting application, right, that you foresee or maybe you are doing right now of uh, machine learning? And I'm going to start with you this time. So, um, so if, talking about machine learning, I think one of the things that's mo most exciting is the ability to do field-to-field -field mapping. So we run these very large scale simulations. We use molecular dynamic simulations, highly nonlinear. And the, the simulations take the amount of, uh, of time that uh, Karen was talking about. And we can do very few. And we're interested, we're in material science. And if you know anything about material science, we care about microstructure and defects. So things that localize strain and you get very nonlinear response 
when you apply an insult to a material that has microstructure and defects. So we spend this enormous amount of time to generate um, idealized defects, and we can understand, okay, if I have this boundary, I can understand the stress around it or the temperature around it, or if I have a spherical void. I'm a recovering physicist, so I like spherical voids and circles and stuff like that. But if I generate a microstructure that has very complex interacting defects, our brains are not very good at mapping that to whatever the stress field or, or the temperature field. And actually some of the authors of this work are here, uh, but we were able to map the initial microstructure uh, to the final fields that we care about uh, with a, a type of neural network. And it's, it's actually, we tested it, and it seems to be learning some of the mechanisms that lead to the localization of stress or, or um, uh, temperature, energy, and in ways that um, our brains are just not very good at, uh, to look at things in three dimensions and complex uh, structures. So that allows us to now think about, okay, can I optimize microstructures in ways that were not possible because I reduce the time it takes to generate one of these answers by many, many orders of magnitude. Uh, and even if the answer is not perfect, I can then go back, reduce the number of tests that I need to run a high fidelity simulation on, um, but, but doing it brute force with a high fidelity simulation would be impossible. Do, do you want to go next? The most exciting thing? Yeah, the most exciting thing. So. Um, you know, I, I sort of feel obliged as an aerospace engineer to give an aerospace answer, but actually I think the most exciting thing that I see going on is the revolution of medicine. Uh, recognizing that when it comes to biological systems, the maturity of the m understanding of the phenomenon and the mathematical models, like I talked about today in engineering, it's just not there in medicine. But at the same time, there's such a revolution going on in sensing and data. And again, that even so, the data that can be collected is indirect, imperfect, sparse, noisy, all these things. But putting it all together, including what machine learning can bring, and recognizing that unlike in engineering where you're creating something from nothing, and if that something is is something where people are gonna fly on it or people are gonna drive on it. It has to be essentially perfect. It has to be, you know, failure probabilities of 10 to the minus nine. In medicine, people are getting sick every day and thinking about how computing can lead to better outcomes and replace the basic trial and error and sort of general population experience base. I mean, to me that this is just so exciting, and I think that revolution is just, just beginning today. Antonio? Yes, yeah, I, I, I honestly I find very exciting um, um, the ability to create um, some kind of artificial intelligence that is fairly general. Um, for example, all the things that you showed in your talk, I think it's like it takes an, an entire career for, for one of us, and not all, all can do it, <laughs> to, to really understand uh, all of that you showed, right? And uh, I'm trying to, uh, for me, the interesting part is how do we create uh, some algorithm that can get close, closer and closer to, to that level of, uh, of understanding material or uh, creating uh, new instruments. Um, yeah, even in the medical field that, that you mentioned, I, I think some, sometimes, you know, like you said, um, we still lack um, instruments to, to measure the things we want, even in medicine, because there are so many scales, like in, in material. And, uh, and, and I feel like even maybe our brain is uh, it's too small to comprehend all this enormous amount of data, right? That, that, that if we could get uh, an assistant or something that can expand it or, uh, or just help us and say, well, you know, you look at all this and uh, there's a trend. And I think that's to me is exciting. Um, there's, there's a lot of problems, honestly. But I agree with, with Karen, sort of at the high level, there's, I think there's a whole set of problems that previously, you know, as a recovering physicist as well, that have an irreducible complexity to them, that we don't have any good approximations, and we know that there's so many layers of complexity that 
we that we're not going to have that good of approximations and that finally with empirical models we can get some purchase on and you can do a lot of good with those models out in the world so i think in medical applications especially where um, at the end of the day you care about is this thing reducing error rates on diagnoses is this thing right i mean so there's a lot of domains where you can have massive impact by sort of embracing the complexity um, I would also say that in my domain, there's a lot of problems where uh, th there's almost a phase change with size. So problems that we sort of know that we had enough information going into it, but we can't hold all that information in a human brain. So a lot of design problems are like this, where you say, so-and-so, I need to talk to this expert medicinal chemist because they've got all of this lore in their heads and they sort of know what's going to be soluble they kind of know oh no that's going to cause problems during scale up they've got all of this stuff sort of baked into their experience over years and years and we never had a way of getting that experience out of their brains but i'm i'm actually optimistic that a lot of what we historically have called sort of lore and heuristics and experience we're going to get better and better at putting into these big systems i think that's that's it's going to democratize and maximize the utilization of that knowledge in a way that currently that's all bundled up in sort of individual expertise. Thank you. I, I think that we all, you all share what you are excited about. So now I want to see if you can share also what you are worried about with all these new uh, technologies, right? I, I can start. I think the, the main is we, meaning the uh, the public academic institutions are not controlling this technology and are not driving this technology. These are being driven, these tools that we're using are being driven by corporations. And they're the ones that have the facilities, data, the person power to push the field forward. And we are using the tools that they're driving. And of course, a lot of the folks here are doing excellent work and uh, contributing in our own domains uh, but we're not in the uh, driver's seat. And so we are dependent uh, on, on corporations and where they decide to go. These LLMs came basically out of nowhere. I'm uh, really worried that the race to embrace machine learning and AI and to go faster and to show great results for problems we could never solve before is going to come at the expense of investing in a portfolio of approaches and also at the expense of the collapse of the academic enterprise. Um, I mean, you heard in my talk some criticism. It is not okay to have models that have many more hyperparameters than you have data points and to tune those hyperparameters to get an answer that looks good and then publish it. It is not okay, and that is what is happening today. It is not okay for so many reasons, and at the very fundamental level, it's not okay mathematically. If you have an underdetermined system, you can get whatever answer you want. You tell me what answer you want, and I'll give it to you, and it will satisfy the equations. It is not okay, and somehow, uh, you know, you can't blame the researchers that are doing this because the academic system is rewarding that behavior through publications, funding, recognitions, and this is not the fault of AI and machine learning, but it's sort of coming, and I think it's tied to almost a system that is out of control. And I don't know what the answer is, but I feel like we as academics all have to take a step back and say, this is not okay, and put a stop to it, because if not, in 10 years, I really worry about where we're gonna be. We are building a building on a foundation of sand. So, it worries me. Yes, uh, one of the one of the worries that I have, honestly, is that um, uh, actually what we're producing here, you know, more and more technology or tools, uh, is slowly um, eroding the uh, the amount of work that uh, humans can do. I, I feel in a way, right? And we've seen this uh, over the last century or so. But even so, now, for example, now we have tools that can write for you, that can write code for you. Uh, so slowly, we'll have. Uh, less and less uh, uh, work work to do maybe um, and oh no okay part part of it is <laughs> I feel like it's what we want because maybe 
the most of us are lazy and you know I, I for example I would like to write the last program that I'll ever write and then not, not have to deal with it uh, but then then I wonder okay what am I gonna do with all that time right and <laughs> and so how how uh, will I feel fulfilled and actually by the way we already see this now I feel like in the last hundred years because we're not uh, fighting uh, every day for food or you know we have to go and use all our time to get food um, you know, most of us have to can sit at home, watch TV, and uh, do computers, and then uh, academics. Um, but sometimes I feel like we, um, and because we have all this tool, also we became less social. Um, so I feel like we already <laughs> we already going away from our natural course. And um, and if um, we also take away our job, I don't know what's going to happen of us. Uh, so we'll see. Don't, don't tell the students that they can work less. <laughs> yeah, I think all of us are concerned more about the sort of cultural problems than some kind of doomsday scenario. So um, I think those are overblown, but I think the cultural problems are are probably underappreciated. Um, so there's there's this um, there's this asleep at the wheel phenomenon, right? So that with people who are using these things, they actually find that on on problems where experts would ordinarily be successful when they're using an LLM as an assistant, they'll actually do worse on those problems because they're sort of asleep at the wheel. They're, they're trusting it in a context where they would have ordinarily been using their brains. And um, you can kind of extrapolate that out into a whole host of scenarios, right? So another, another image that's maybe useful is we, through all of our hard work uh, and education, um, you know, we've, we've built up the infrastructure that made these, these systems possible and then we might dismantle all of the all of the scaffolding and everything that made that possible we might actually you know dismantle it by becoming too reliant on them so i don't know how we how we grapple with that it's very early days still but i think these are very serious problems especially as people who are in academia and concerned about producing people and the next generation of humans so i think we have yeah we have 10 minutes uh, until we finish. So I'm going to ask uh, the last question. And so you have a couple of minutes each. Um, so I asked you at the beginning, the first question was, how do we, what do we need to train? How do we need to train the students, right? That are going to do the next thing. The question now is, what do we need to learn to be able to train the students on that, right? Because most of us are not prepared to be teaching everything that we mentioned, right? Uh, you mentioned, I didn't mention anything. <laughs> everything that you mentioned. So how do you train us to do that? Hmm. I think we're working it out as we go, so I'll, I'll just jump in here. I mean, I will admit my, my ignorance, and so we have, uh, for instance, in our group, we have tutorials every week, and basically, I feel like um, my current plan is to keep these going year-round. Several of my, my students are out here, but it's basically because I feel like the landscape is changing so quickly, and I'm constantly learning things that I think they need to know, and I am having them teach me things that I think we all need to know. So we have these, these going year-round. And you know the idea that you're done being educated once you're done with your coursework, I think we all know that that's a little too, too simplistic. So we're working it out as we go. Yeah, I definitely second that. And I think it's, uh, yeah, we have to keep training and uh, and learn from other the other side, the, the other people that we work with uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, um, landscape is changing fast. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I guess I would emphasize the importance of uh, education across boundaries and sort of interdi interdisciplinary thinking to education because the reality is that one collection of faculty are not and never will be equipped to provide the students with everything they, they need to know, especially in the changing landscape. And, you know, if you think about an engineering undergraduate degree, right, there's some math content in there. Some universities have the math department teaching the math classes. Other universities have the engineers teaching the math classes. You know, the same could be said for computing classes for all these others. I've come uh, to appreciate just how important it is for the students to be exposed 
to faculty across a range of different departments and cultures because if I were, if I as an engineer were to teach math, I would teach it very differently to a mathematician. And while that can be seen to be difficult or negative for the students, it's a huge benefit when we start to grapple with these issues because seeing the way that other fields just think about the language they use, the way in which they approach problems, the culture they have towards things, I think is so incredibly important. So, you know, I think you, your question was, how do we prepare ourselves? I think the answer is we have to be better team members with our colleagues all across campus. And by the way, not just on campus, the experiential learning that will take place through internships, we as faculty have to find a way to promote that even more than we have in the past so that the students are going out into the real world and getting exposure to some of these things that we just are not, not equipped. Um, so I think we need more of that. We've always needed it, but we need more of it than we ever have before. Yeah, other than retiring to a beach somewhere, uh, which, is, which is an, uh, an option, uh, would be, so I, I think it's striking the right balance. Again, I, I think we need to continue to teach the fundamentals. Right, that's going to make the difference. Um, and the other things are tools, right? And energy conservation, momentum conservation. Uh, we need to, as engineers, understand those things. At the same time, how do we, I think in our research, we all experience this, in part because we have talented grad students that are curious and uh, explore things and have ideas, and that's how we educate ourselves to a very large degree. And Translating that into the classroom is a challenge, right? It requires thought. You know, when we teach a, a degree, it's not just a random collection of knowledge, right? But it's a body of work that kind of makes sense together. So it's not like you can introduce, uh, you know, willy-nilly uh, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence or, ML, or, or LLMs. At the same time, our, our curriculum needs to evolve uh, to make sure that our students have uh, these tools and also know how to use them appropriately and when not to use them. You know, what are the right problems to use a neural network? What are the wrong problems to use a neural network? So it's a, it's a balancing act and, uh, and it's challenging to try to cram in more and more in four years uh, because we can't let the fundamentals go, right? So it's, it's not an easy, it's about learning, but it's also how do we change what we teach and how we teach. I think there's an opportunity in labs where a lot of them will use very antiquated ways of handling uh, data. And, and maybe that's a way to maybe incorporate more uh, modern tools. Okay, so I think we have just two minutes. Uh, so if you would like to add anything, feel free. Or, or maybe we can take one question from the audience. Yes, go ahead. So, Mike. So, um, you know, throughout history, whenever we've developed tools, every single tool is developed with a specific purpose in mind, with a specific problem that it was meant to solve. You know, a hammer was meant to hit things, a screwdriver was meant to screw in screws, whatever. Artificial intelligence right now, I'm not really sure what problem these large general models are attempting to solve. And it's funny to think about it because when we think about you know, artificial intelligence, we relate it to human intelligence as a benchmark. And yet we don't expect humans to be good across the board in the same way that we expect general artificial intelligence to be. You know, we're testing it not only on you know, how, how much legal terminology it knows, we're also testing it on its mathematical knowledge, on its coding abilities, on everything. Whereas with humans even, you know, we're specializing in our certain fields. We each have our own problem that we are trying to become experts to solve. So my question basically is, A, is there actually like a specific problem that these large general models are trying to solve? And if not, should we be trying to focus them? And instead of trying to make this one size fits all model that can do absolutely everything and become the ultimate co-pilot, should every single person have individual models that are designed to assist just them in just one field to fit just one problem. I'll just share one quick fact here. Uh, historically, there was the idea that you had to specialize and that a specialized model was always going to outcompete a broad model. But in these benchmarks, it seems that general knowledge tends to help you 
in particular tasks. So that's one of the really surprising things about these benchmarks is these really broad models that weren't trained on specific tasks tend to do very well at specific tasks in a zero shot manner or after giving them a small number of examples, they can be very good at them. And uh, there is an analogy with humans though. So I would actually push back with what you said about we don't expect one human to do a lot, but what do we have? We have a very general curriculum for human beings up until they specialize. And it appears that there is a huge benefit for general training for these models before you maybe then go and fine tune them on specific tasks. So I think we're actually only for the first time training models analogous to how we actually do train humans, which is with a very broad knowledge base before specialization. I think that's actually what we're seeing right now. Any, do you want to chime in or another question from the audience? Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much for all your insights. So I had one question about incorporating fundamental knowledge into artificial intelligence because one of the main aspects is that we want to train neural networks that not only predict information but can also be explainable and can maybe help us advance science and fundamental knowledge. So I was just wondering how we could maybe use machine learning in even advancing fundamental science and research and how that could be sort of a synergistic tool in also incorporating maybe ideas that are maybe abstract, but maybe can be more quantified through these tools. I think we saw a great example today, right? Interpretable machine learning that you don't have to always use a neural network. Yeah. Yeah, and the, you know, the question you're asking is, is there's a huge amount of, of research going into this, which is you know, there, there are many parts. One part is how do you embed the physics? And sort of the, maybe the, the simplest and some of the, the approaches that we've seen is to include it weekly in the loss function. But there's a lot of work going to look and see how do you impose um, you know, the physics in a more fundamental way inside the models, for example, through symmetries or invariants. Right? I mean, I showed the physics through the lens of, I can write it down as a partial differential equation, but we know that there are other ways in which physical principles manifest, for example, with symmetries and variances. And so I know there's you know, a lot of research into how you could embed that, whether it's a neural network representation or something else. So I think that's part of it. You know, the interpretability is another part of it. And I do think this question of what's the purpose is very important because what does interpretability mean? Well, it depends. Is there a human decision maker? Are the human decision maker making an A, B decision or something more complex? And I don't think it will one size, be one size fits all. So, you know, it's, it's a really important set of questions. And I think that really represents the frontiers of where at least the scientific community is engaging with AI right now and the questions that are being asked. I think we are over time, but I will give one more question if someone is really willing to do it. Yeah, one more. Well, uh, one thing that I think is interesting is that usually technologies come out and then um, there's like a delay period before we decide certain legislation to protect them. For example, cars existed long before we had the laws to have uh, seat belts. And so maybe in, we can put it in the specifics of like science, like how do you think, um, you know, when it comes to publications and validating your models, what are certain rules that don't exist yet in terms of you know, policing um, uh, people who are publishing papers using machine learning maybe in a very arbitrary way where uh, it might lead us to some trouble down the, down the line? Yeah, maybe I can, so I think this is, this is a, a, a important question to ask. With re regard to publications, particularly, I think it's a little unfortunate that the timing of this wave of machine learning and AI came at the same time that the publishing model for academics was being completely overturned and we were seeing the rise of the for-profit publishers and the pay-to-publish. And so that was, it was sort of the perfect storm. <clears throat> so for publications specifically, I think there are other, there are other issues, but, um, you know, I think you could ask that question. You could look at other forms of uh, computational modeling and simulation that have been used and have been, <coughs> excuse me, 
have um, have had uh, legislation and certification around them and their use. Um, and there are a lot of examples of that again in engineering, in the nuclear nuclear engineering world and aerospace. So I think there are, are examples that we could look to look at for that. Just, just quickly, I, I think the, the we, we need to rethink publication. Uh, the outcome of this type of research is the model, the data, and the paper should be secondary. But we put it upside down because the incentives are upside down because academics uh, are after citations on H index and there's no H index for sharing a model that people actually use or a model that people can actually train. So reviewing a paper is extremely hard except for these basic uh, type of checks that you can do by reading a paper if you don't have easy, easy access to the model and to the data. So to me, the publication has to be the model, it has to be open, the data needs to be there so anyone can try it and it needs to be reusable and people should be able to try it and, and see whether uh, if you use it for anything outside of what, what, what it was uh, trained on, it's, it's a complete disaster. Uh, publications ha hasn't, was talking to my group, the first paper was published, is considered scientific paper, was published in England in 1666, and you can go and look, it, look at it, and it looks exactly like the papers we write today, except now we have color uh, uh, titles. That's the only difference, okay? <laughs> That seems silly to me. Okay, so I think, as I say, we are over time. And so let me thank all the panelists here. Thank you very much. <laughs>